So, hi everyone. Um, my presentation is a bit different because I'm recruiting members for my cult. Um, it's about over communication. I thought it's uh, appropriate to start a cult for that. And just so I can really quickly introduce myself. So, I'm Benson, and I know that you really don't care much about this, but I work at this software platform team inside QVD.com. The only reason I'm saying this is because it kind of matters. Uh, the team is responsible for making our engineers more productive, and communication is really lots of what engineers do, so I'm kind of working with this Slack thing. All right, so let me just quickly explain what I mean by public by default. It's basically the rule or law that my team follows for communication, and also like lots of other things at Kiwi that I managed to convince already to try my call. And just to really show you this example, the, the following messages are publicly available for all Kiwicon employees. That's like 2,500 people. So they can all see whenever my team is talking about uh, tasks that they are working on, whenever they are like requesting, getting feedback about something, even criticism. Uh, they see when somebody has a status update about where they are, what they're doing. They see when somebody has an idea. And like honestly, like anything that people talk about that doesn't need to be secret, that goes public. So, of course, there are some exceptions. Sometimes we need to keep things secret. That's about like people's salaries, for instance. When we are just yeah, renting privately or when we have some sort of security bugs. But yeah, like public by default means that if you don't have a very good reason to keep something secret, it just goes public for the entire company. And so in the next 30 minutes of your life, I'm going to be talking about what the business value is in this form of communication. I'm going to talk about what the value is for people in your company. And I'm going to be bringing up some of the concerns that people mention usually, and also why I don't think they are the concerns. All right. And quick disclaimer, so this is about creative work. Um, I'm really not suggesting for you to implement this sort of communication in like a factory, assembly line workers, or sales, like sales reps who are just making 50 calls per day. Uh, I don't think these rules really apply to them. But anyone else, like leaders or product people, engineers, they are like who works with creative stuff, these rules apply to them. So, the business value, and also this is a testament to how I really don't know how to manage my time. Like, let's say 20% of the time I spent in the presentation was spent making these GIFs. Uh, it's really not. All right, let's just skip ahead. So, basically, the one, the, the first reason, the most obvious one is that people just spend less time communicating. Take the following example. Amy, software engineer, she implemented some sort of feature and she wants to check how the feature is doing. So she wants to check the metrics on Google Analytics, but she doesn't have an account yet. So quite sadly, this is really kind of depressing, but very often what people do in this case is they just go directly to someone they know from the team in private and they ask them, uh, I tried to actually draw this diagram of what happens sometimes. So Amy asks, let's say, Brittany in analytics to help with getting this access. So Brittany goes to, who else is that? Charlie. And Charlie's going to maybe approve the request. Uh, but of course, they need the reason. So he asks Brittany, like, why does she want access? So this goes back, back and forth. Um, and at the end, because there's so much back and forth and people are not responding immediately, uh, Charlie is now out sick, so he's not able to actually give the approval. So we move on. Uh, we don't have the labels anymore, but it doesn't even really matter. The point is that now uh, Britain is going to ask somebody else for approval. Sometime they actually get that. Then an engineer who knows how to configure Google Analytics will actually um, give the access and then the news that the access is provided somehow propagates back to Amy. Uh, but then it turns out that they configured it wrong, so Amy's gonna tell Brad or whoever B was, I don't even remember. Yeah, it's just lots of problems, I would say. It's, the problems are because each of these steps has some communication time, but okay, fine, that's like one or two minutes, that really doesn't matter that much. Uh, the real big problem is that each of these steps adds to like a project being blocked or some task, somebody being blocked. And that can range every step 
from like five minutes to a couple of days even when somebody is really not responding very quickly to their messages because of course they have no like there's no expectation for people to respond immediately to any sort of request coming in from side channels and the third problem is that we always have a chance of miscommunication you know whenever people are relaying messages and playing this game of telephone the messages are not going to be entirely accurate as they are passed around all right, so I'm just gonna show you what this looks like with my cult's ideal map of communication. We have one channel for like requests for analytics and the context is always available. And this is the entire, like we had the same exact problems. Charlie got sick, uh, the access was provided wrong, but it's super simple to fix and work around all of these problems when people are not relaying messages. Um, that's actually, that cut the steps in half. Now we have, eight steps instead of 19, I think. So let's just try to calculate the savings in money. Uh, okay, so, no. that, that doesn't really work like that. I honestly spend lots of time, I, I think I spend hours trying to come up with some sort of equation considering everything, the cost of blocked time, the opportunity cost of not doing something else during the same time and so on. Um, I cannot really put a number to it, but you have to agree with me that you're going to spend less time on just idling. You're going to spend less salaries for your team to just not do anything. Um, you spend less time on, who was that, Brittany, I think? You're, you're going to spend less time on making Brittany coordinate the messages and projects because of the less blocking are going to be delivered earlier. So that's, I would say that's pretty good. Um, we're going to reason number two, and there's 13 of them, so I'm just going to speed up a little. Um, it's super easy to prevent duplicate work when all of the work is public. Somebody is sure to take notice when we are starting to work on something else, which would be a huge waste of time. Something that has already been done or talked about before, or maybe dismissed. Um, number three is that with like, all of these public messages, you have a free blob of basically a knowledge base. You're curious about, let's say, whether we already negotiated with some partner. And even though the information is going to be very low fidelity, like it's not really formatted very well, very understandably, but the coverage is amazing. You would need to employ like 10% of your employees to really cover all of this information of what's going on in your company to document all of that nicely. So yeah, you get this free knowledge base. Next, I assume most of you are startup people, so you're going to be happy about failing faster. Um, as, see, that's how you fail. <laughs> All right, that was completely accidental. I swear I didn't plan that as a joke, so I'm glad that you didn't laugh. All right, uh, so basically failing faster, you know, um, big startup mantra that everyone has. Obviously, it's not a great way to find out when you're failing or when you're going down the wrong track with some idea if you're keeping it all to yourself or within your team and you don't let some, somebody else you know, maybe notice that hey, this thing is working on something that might not be working as well as it should. And I think this point about fast failures and you know, just in general humans failing, I think it's a great segue into what I think the root of my entire talk is. I just want you to stop trusting people. Like, humans are kind of really bad at everything compared to machines. I don't think humans are really able to like plan things, complicated things like communication channels correctly. So whenever I see some chart like this, uh, I just found this on Google, I don't know what it is. Thankfully, it's not from Kiwi. Um, whenever I see something like this, I look at every single line and I think, there's like a 1% ch chance that, that the line is not supposed to be there in one particular case. So if there's like 100 lines and you execute this process 100 times, um, you're gonna have 10,000 chances of messing up something. I really don't think people should be planning this directly. And yeah, no, I don't think so. And that's not even all. I also think that we should tr stop trusting people to do things right, even when we give them a plan. Um, that's again what machines are good at, but when we have, let's say, um, code, for instance, that we are trying to get to production, like one person cannot push to production, we know, we learned over like tens of years of engineering that programmers are always making mistakes just like everyone else. 
we always put things through review. So I basically I, I feel like communication should be exact, the exact same thing. You just don't do things, you don't communicate without having oversight by somebody else to notice when you are inevitably making tons of mistakes, because we all do. And I think uh, one of the biggest mistakes that people often make is the decisions about when something should be published, which is why I think it's much easier to just decide that we are public by default, we don't even try to make decisions, we are going to mess it up like 10% of the time, so let's just not make the decision, let's just always be correct by publishing everything. All right, so that was kind of a long sidetrack. Uh, let's get back to this like lightning round of reasons. Number five, uh, kind of related to this thing about people being bad at doing stuff. Like how, if you have 10 people in your team and you're starting out a project planning meeting by inviting two of them to plan the project, like why would you think that you managed to pick the correct two people? It's, it's so unlikely that you're just randomly picking the correct people. So why not just mention the project to everyone, let them read it, it takes them like five seconds to see what you're planning and bring out their ideas. And then it isn't even that you're going to be able to pick the correct two people, but actually you're going to be picking from the ideas. So you don't even need to worry about it. You're reducing your problem space so much that it, it just leads to seriously much better ideas. All right, number six, this one is the last business reason I think public channels are great. And I'm really sorry to be so boring with like just going on and on about more and more reasons, but I couldn't choose which one is more important. Um, I feel like people are more pragmatic when people see what everyone is doing. Um, people just do things better, right? If, if there is oversight and if you know that somebody else is going to be looking at your work, you're going to pay a tiny bit more attention than if you're doing something just for yourself, like hiding in your whatever corner office. All right, all right. Let's take a tiny little break again. Um, we are halfway through the reasons, so that's some big news. Uh, so about the people value category. Um, people value is really like, there's such a blurred line between people value and business value. Uh, if your people are happier and they individually are able to do more, that just directly translates into more value for the business. But still I had to categorize them somehow because the list of certain things was just way too long. <laughs> okay, so um, there are some companies that I kind of trust. Uh, there's GitLab, there's Buffer. Uh, they are doing lots of things for transparency, they are publishing lots of their internal rules. And one of the things from Buffer that really stuck with me is this quote uh, where they published this mantra that they think transparency breeds trust and trust is the foundation of great teamwork at their team, right? Um, again, you can kind of imagine that if you have a team which every morning 9 a.m. just goes, hides, locks themselves into their room and nobody ever knows what they're doing, Obviously, you're not going to go to the team and just trust them with any random thing. Like, you're going to have questions what they are doing. You're not, I'm not saying you're going to excessively distrust them, but it's very difficult to trust somebody if you haven't really put in the time of, you know, like, social interaction. All right, we are getting through this really quick now. But this is my favorite reason, I think about the mental models that build up when public communication is available, when public info is available. And we are gonna play a tiny bit of a game. Um, so every one of you assume that you and I are friends. Kubo, you, you should not just assume we are friends. <laughs> um, and my birthday is coming up. And I graciously dropped some sort of a hint, like I just made an offhanded remark that Man, like the 70s old comics, comic books, they are like really cool. So, um, somehow you come across this Facebook marketplace listing, somebody is selling a couple of comics and you want to buy one of them for me for my birthday. Which one do you choose? And you have like, I'll give you like three seconds to just think about it. We have like Superman, Batman, Mickey Mouse, Walt Disney, Scooby Doo, and so on. Okay, so. I would say there are two correct choices here. The Disney comics, and 
I, I cannot prove this right now, audience participation never works, but I'm kind of confident that around half of the audience at least got this right. And that's because of these passive mental models. Um, very recently you saw me using a GIF of a Donald Duck cartoon. It was here, you know, like 10 minutes ago. Which kind of um, primes you in some way to connect Disney cartoons perhaps with my person. And this sort of, uh, these sort of passive mental models that are built just by seeing some, any sort of topic related to another topic, it's actually a great way for your creative team members to start making better decisions. Uh, you can kind of um, have a good passive understanding in your team of how your customer, what your customers want, of how the industry works, and when they are making these tiny micro decisions as developers who are implementing some feature which was not specified 100% accurately, when you know, like developers need to make tiny decisions, the more they know about how other parts of the business works because they might have been following it, the better their like tiny decisions are going to make. All right. Number four, uh, I know this was really long, so number, four, uh, number nine, that's atmosphere. I think talking to each other is fun. Yeah, let's skip that. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, the next thing is about having subjects everywhere in your work. Uh, and what I mean by this, I prepared this cursed image of Gmail. Imagine if your Gmail looked like this, and you know, you, you get back from lunch and you're trying to handle all of your emails and you have no idea what any of them are about. So I, I kind of feel like the same thing exists on Slack when people communicate directly. I get back from lunch and then I see this and I need to make decisions like, what am I gonna do first? What's the most urgent? I have no idea to tell. But you know, if you have public communication, you will see that Honzo actually was just writing in the, the gaming channel and we have an outage right now. All right. I think that's also pretty self-explanatory, so let's just skip and there's only three more. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of hope that maybe around two or three will stick with everyone, but hopefully you can pick the best two and three for yourself. And also tell me, because tomorrow I'm holding the same talk in Prague, and hopefully I can cut like half of these. Yeah, you're, you're kind of like my test lab rats right now, and you will tell me which ones I can cut. All right, so then we have better flexibility. Um, you know, when people in your team, again, I keep saying people in your team because that's what this is about still. If they know what other teams are doing, it's gonna be much easier to reassign them to what really matters. And I, I think recently there has been some hype about having dynamic organizations which are able to actually react when some new project, some new problem becomes very urgent and crucial. So, that gets much more difficult if people don't know what each other are doing, like with, with the other, other, other things I'm doing. All right, number 12, easier to gather context. I don't want to talk about it much more. And the last one that I want to mention is psychological safety for people. So this is actually about uh, some research that Google has done about what makes their most effective teams effective. What they found after like really rigorous, pragmatic research is that the number one reason why some teams are more effective than others is because the team members feel psychologically safe, which means they are not afraid to ask questions, they are not afraid to bring up ideas. And I feel like the best way to like, induce this sort of safety is showing, like leading by example, having, let's say, the 5% of your the company, the thought leaders, admit their mistakes publicly and showing an example for others that everyone is totally welcome to make mistakes and admit them and everyone is totally welcome to just bring up ideas. All right, so that was 13. Good job everyone who managed to sit through all this. Um, but there's a bit more of the talk. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so over the years, I had quite a few discussions with people, some debates. 
and there are some concerns that keep being raised about public communication. And what I started feeling like is that these concerns, they, they all come up because it's just so unnatural. It's, it's really unconventional to keep everything public. So people just have this fear. And that's another two hours of my life. <laughs> yeah, I, I learned how to do 3D motion tracking specifically for this presentation. I could have made the talk better, but I didn't. All right. <laughs> So, yeah, basically there's this unfamiliarity with public communication and people are just scared of it, I think. Uh, the first fear that people bring up is that having these public discussions, they're just going to be like endless. People are going to keep commenting, keep bringing up new things to consider and keep arguing about things. Here, I really think that your problem is actually just weak leadership. If you let you know, discussions take so long, and after, let's say, a hundred messages, you're not saying that, all right, that's enough, we're gonna make a decision now. That's just completely your fault, I would say. All right. Fear number two is about leaking secrets. And I have, like, no real good argument against this, but, like, Google engineers can get access to their entire code base on day one. I, I really don't know what could really go wrong? Um, I haven't really, like, this seems like the exact case of just fear, you know, for irrational fear. You can maybe assume that your employees are not out there to get you. Um, really nothing has gone wrong for us, and even if something would go wrong, I doubt that it would really affect us for more than, let's say, a week. It's really not worth worrying about that much. All right. Fear number three, and there's only one more after this, so, and, and that's the end of the talk. I'm <laughs> happy to tell you. Yeah. So, um, some people are afraid that reading Slack too much is actually, like, a huge time waster. Um, for this, I'm able to justify reading Slack for hours every day, uh, because I truly believe that people's creative output is limited every day. Um, it's, I think, okay, in my case, I work like three or four hours per day usefully. Uh, this, that's the same whether I have Slack or not. I think if, there, if I really didn't have Slack, I would just spend the same time on Facebook or Reddit or whatever. So I think it's better to make a voluntary decision to do something, like spend my time on something actually productive for the company in some indirect way than just involuntarily coming up with some, whatever, Facebook, or just staring at my screen and not doing anything. All right, and the last thing, um, the fear of information overload, when there's just so much data available, like tons of messages, and nobody knows what to do with them, and that's actually a problem, <laughs> okay. I, I, this is truly a problem, uh, I don't have an argument against this. But what I would suggest is that instead of avoiding this problem, try solving it instead. I think we already, with all of those reasons that you managed to sit through, we saved so much time. You are really able, to, you should really be able to invest some of that into solving the problem of information overload and educating people how to handle it educating on how to use the tools correctly that we have available for communication and designing better channels for communication. All right. Can't believe that was 25 minutes. Felt like 50. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so again, just because I'm sure you really love this list of 13, there it is again. And I really want you guys to get over those fears, get over the fear of the unnatural and unconventional public by default mantra, and just invest in fixing that information overload. Thank you.